I'm uh, Keith McCormick of uh, Qubit. I want to tell you uh, something real quick about this uh, preview. Uh, we've chosen about 15 minutes from our IBM SPSS modeler seminar series. We do this uh, series every month. We haven't necessarily chosen the first 15 minutes. We're trying to choose a 15 minutes um, that all by itself is really interesting. Hope you learn something. And I hope, uh, you know, obviously you kind of become intrigued about the seminar series and you want to find out more about it. But we really think that this short segment will have some value uh, in and of itself. I hope you'll seek out the other previews that we have on this, uh, on this channel. Enjoy. So this is another model that you have uh, available in Modeler another model that allows you to reduce the amount of data that you have. And, you know, uh, Keith and I, we both have our reservations about feature selection, but, it, you know, it, it can do a job. But, you know, you just have to, uh, you have to make, really make sure that you check your work. So what feature selection does is, you know, it allows you to determine which fields might be good predictors. So it identifies fields that are most related to the outcome. And in the end, really what it does is it ends up acting as a filter that ends up removing fields. Now, the way um, feature selection works, basically what it does is it eliminates fields that have too much missing data or very little variation or variability. So, you know, this is uh, the dialog box, the, uh, the main dialog box for the feature selection model. And you can see that, you know, we could, uh, we could specify that we could remove any fields that have uh, higher than, you know, a certain percentage of missing information. The default is set to 70. Now, you know, like, uh, like Keith mentioned, sometimes when you have fields that have a lot of missing information, they're missing information, that information for a reason. And that reason, you know, sometimes you might have had a null value where it really should have been a value of zero or some other specified value. So sometimes you may not necessarily want to eliminate those fields, even though they do have a lot of missing information. You also could reclassify the field so that you interpret that field slightly different. Uh, instead of, you know, specifying how much you have of that particular um, item or, or, or that field, of whatever it is, you might uh, specify whether or not they even have it at all. And, you know, you reclassify the field that way. You basically uh, answer that uh, you have information for them or you don't. So that might end up giving you some key insight into the, into the data as well. So, again, just something to be a little cautious of with feature selection. It does end up removing fields that have a lot of missing information. That can be very useful at times. But, again, as long as you've checked out those fields, ahead of time, make sure that what you're actually tossing out is not something that could potentially be important. Then uh, the other options that you have here for, uh, for feature selection, they all basically focus on fields that really have uh, two, uh, very little variation. They basically all have very similar values. So there, you have two options for categorical fields. Uh, the first option is basically focusing on any categorical field that where 90% or whatever percentage you specify of, of uh, cases fall into one category. You know, it's basically telling you everybody uh, chose the same thing. So, you know, let's say, for example, we're talking about, um, you know, different products that people own. And let's say uh, one of the questions is, do you own a TV? Well, you know, probably over 90% of people are going to own uh, a TV. So, you know, it, that variable potentially may not really be that useful. So that's what this option will allow you to remove a field like that. Uh, you might also have um, the, the third option that you see there, maximum number of categories as a percentage of records. Sometimes you have a categorical field where you have so many categories, and really, you know, it, each category has such a small number of cases, and that could end up being a problem as well. So that's what that option uh, helps you with. Uh, the two options that, the last two options that you see there, the um, coefficient of variation or minimum standard deviation, they're both, both focusing on continuous fields and really continuous fields where there, there really is not very much variation. So again, people are really giving you the same result all the time. So again, they, typically you could remove those. A, a couple of things that I would uh, add to that is that I think if a variable is thrown out uh, that has no standard deviation or extremely low minimum coefficient of variation, my gut tells me there's very few ways to save that variable. It's probably not going to help you. However, um, Jesus's example of the TVs is a great idea, a great example, rather, of a variable that can get thrown out by the second criterion. If every single person who does not have a TV buys your product or does not buy your product, 
even if it's three percent versus ninety-seven percent, that could turn out to be an interesting one. So I guess what I would be saying is that I usually leave the second and the third ones turned on. I utilize them, and I usually don't adjust those settings. But those are two that I would be more skeptical about. That if I saw a variable discarded for that reason, I might visualize it before I confirm that I'm going to throw it out. And, and that's an excellent example you have there, Keith, because let's say, for example, we're talking about a company like Netflix, and you know, you, you'll, you might have a certain number of people, a very small percentage of people that do not have TVs, but really what they care about is streaming in the video to their computers. And so they may be high users, but not in a traditional sense where they're renting the actual videos, instead they're streaming in information onto their machines. Absolutely. By the way, uh, we think well, not because we're mentioning it now, but uh, uh, actually talking in some detail about auto data prep. But you know, we're finding uh, there's a lot of material on a lot of these subjects. You know, seemingly everyday subjects. Auto data prep is another node that also performs some screening. I can't imagine that there'd be too many situations where you'd want to do auto data prep and do feature selection, at least for the selection aspects of those two nodes. I think I prefer, of the two, feature selection, and I think Jesus is not, and Jesus does as well. Keep in mind that that's also out there, and I'm sure that there's a model or user somewhere right now that's using the combination of the two, but gosh, I would think that that stream gets a little bit hard for their coworkers to read, because there's a lot that's going on automatically there, and if there's no critical review of these automatic nodes, I if I saw auto data prep immediately followed by feature selection, that would immediately get my attention. I would, I would immediately want to ask that person how thoughtful they were about the inclusion of both. But just so you know, feature selection is not the only node that does this. And, and actually, as, as Keith mentioned earlier, you know, maybe about half an hour ago, there are some models that do feature selection directly within the model. So, uh, you know, he gave the example of uh, K and N. Um, that's one model that uses feature selection right directly within the model, but BayesNet Bayes Net does as well. So, you know, it is uh, it is out there in several ways. And C5, C5 as well, yeah. So uh, now uh, I haven't given a chance to comment on this, but statistical significance as a criteria for discarding, I'm extremely skeptical, especially if you haven't looked at interactions especially if you haven't looked at nonlinearity. Very, very, very skeptical there, because if something's significant at 90%, it might interact in interesting ways, even though it doesn't achieve 95. And then, conversely, if you've got 18 million records, then everything is going to be important on this criterion. In fact, you might get more than a couple of random variables to circle back to Scott's experiment that achieved importance if you've got a huge amount of data. Yeah. You know? So this is really something that comes out of you know, Fisher and the 30s and doing experiments. And it's not that it has no place here, but I would suggest that you be skeptical. And, and this is actually related to something. Actually, I may have it on the next slide. No. Um, but this, this is something that is related to something that I was talking about earlier, and when you only focus on just bivariate relationships, and that's, that's what feature selection is doing. It's only looking at the relationship between each predictor and the outcome field, and that's it. It's not taking any other field into account. So just because you find a field that ends up being statistically important here because it, it ends up being statistically significant doesn't necessarily mean that that field is really going to be an important field in the, in the model. But it's also only looking at, you know, at just the main effect, the relationship between that predictor and the outcome field. It's not really taking interactions into account. It's not taking uh, nonlinearity into account, those kinds of things. So, again, you know, just some of the things to, uh, to think about there with, with feature selection. So let's go, let's go through a demonstration, and we're just going to show just kind of uh, how to use feature selection. And actually, I uh, might as well talk about this before we, uh, before we actually show it. You know, these are some of the limitations that uh, both Keith and I, we were, we were talking about uh, feature selection. So again, just because a field uh, ends up being important uh, doesn't necessarily mean that that field is actually going to be a good predictor in the model that you end up choosing. Um, also, 
the, uh, the criteria that's being used here to determine which fields are actually kept by the feature selection uh, model, they're only assessing linear relationships. So underneath, depending on the kind of fields that you have, well, you're basically looking at chi-squares, you're looking at uh, ANOVAs, and you're looking at correlations. So that's really uh, all that, that's really being done there. So we're only really looking at the linear relationships. We're not really taking uh, interactions into account as well. Um, and again, sometimes, like we've mentioned, sometimes mm -hmm. some fields are just removed too quickly when they have uh, some missing data, but, but we might have been able to uh, address that in, in some way earlier. We won't get into it today, but I want to mention it. Uh, something that you have to watch out for is when you accidentally include variables that are perfect predictors of the uh, outcome, okay? And uh, when you do that, um, when you're running in a feature selection, those perfect predictors, which are very dangerous uh, to have, will float up to the top of your uh, feature selection. And there's a recipe that discusses that in the, uh, in the cookbook. And uh, depending on the number and kinds of questions that we get, that's a demonstration that we might do during the Q&A. But watch for those number one variables. They could be your best friend or they could be your biggest problem, but they float up to the top so they're easy to spot. Okay. So I just want to make sure, I just want to confirm, can everybody see my screen? Confirmation would be great. Thank you for that. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so just uh, just quickly, I'm just going to show you how, how feature selection works. Uh, and so basically, I'm just going to use this electronics data set. I'm going to go down to the modeling palette, and I'm going to co connect that data set over to the, uh, the feature selection model. Now, in terms of the feature selection uh, model, actually, let me, let me show you what the data looks like ahead of time here. You know, just a very small data set, very few fields. Uh, you know, I just want to show you, again, just basically how it works. We, you have to specify a target. So we have a, a target that we specify. These are all of my inputs that we have here as well. And then we have a, an ID field that I'm not going to use. So I'm just going to go into the uh, feature selection model. And again, same, same uh, options that uh, we had seen before. I'm just going to leave these all at, at, at the default level. Um, and the uh, same thing here with the other options that you see there as well. Notice that we can specify that we want uh, to only select a certain number of fields if we wanted to, fields that are, uh, have a, an importance value above a certain number. Um, or um, we could also, the default is that we're going to select any field that has a, an important value, and that basically means that it's statistically significant. By the way, um, for those of you that are interested, these importance values, they basically range from zero to one. And all they really are is uh, the, the, the number uh, one minus uh, the actual statistical probability of that relationship. So the higher the number, the, uh, the more important it is, meaning that is, it is the most statistically significant. So that, that's how they're calculated. And uh, I'll just click on run here. And so let's just take a look at what we found. So again, here are the, uh, the different fields. I only had uh, 11 fields in this data set as, as possible predictors. And so it's basically, what it's done is it's sorted those in order of importance. So we see this premier field end up being the, the most important predictor, the one that most, was most related to our outcome field, which was uh, the field status. And then we see the other fields that have been uh, chosen as well. Now, any field that has a check next to it means that it's a field that's been selected. So, again, something that's important to remember about the, the feature selection model is that it's actually serving as a filter. So, we started off with uh, all of these uh, predictors, but really, you know, actually, let me uh, just emphasize that point. Let me just connect the table here. And I'm just going to run the table now. So. Notice that I only have uh, eight fields here, whereas originally I had 11 predictors plus the outcome field plus my ID variable. So really I had a, I had a total of 13 fields. But really it served as a filter and it only ended up allowing me to keep these uh, six predictors that actually have been chosen. So again, I just wanted to, to point that out, that really that's what you end up getting with the, um, with the feature selection model. Now, let's say going back to uh, my slides about deployment, Something 
to think about. Re remember, the, the phrases aren't important. It's just the sequence is important. I define refit as new coefficients, same variables. And refresh is new coefficients and potentially a new list of variables chosen out of a pool. And rebuild the one that you'll probably never realistically be able to automate. So keep in mind that if you wanted it to check to see which variables were currently the most important, maybe in a rapidly changing customer environment, that's a trickier thing to do. You would potentially, well, you'd have to script it. You'd have to have a script re-execute this feature selection to update these checkboxes. You wouldn't necessarily have to go that route. You could have the gold diamond be static in nature, have it not change. But recognize that you've got to be thinking about deployment. You can't just be kind of imagining that if it's sitting there on the screen, it's going to automatically do things. Deployment is really a whole other topic. And at some point, we'll, I'm sure, dedicate an entire seminar to deployment issues. Something else I would say is that pretty much across the board, when I'm in the early phases of a project, I will accept variables at the point eight level and above at least, if not all of them. And then my screen fields, as we talked about last month, that becomes my to-do list. I let them get dropped initially, but I always make a point to look at each and every screen field and determine if I'm really happy saying goodbye to that variable forever, you know. And in and, and this example, we don't have any screen fields, which would have been those fields that either had too much missing information or they could have been fields that uh, did not have enough variation and things like that. But one other thing I wanted to, to point out here is notice that we ended up keeping six fields. We ended up dropping uh, five of these 